1984, I wrote a piece called Idle Chatter. And it was such a big hit <laughs> that I decided to write another piece. I wrote a piece called Just More Idle Chatter. These are both electronic pieces. I've been doing almost exclusively electronic pieces from about 1973 through 2000. I mean, it was basically my specialty. Uh, but these pieces used uh, sort of chattering voices and kind of had a rhythmic context and a rhythmic framework. And after I wrote Just More Idle Chatter, I decided to write another piece called Not Just More Idle Chatter. And let me just play you a little segment of Not Just More Idle Chatter. <laughs> Okay, there are certain things you notice about that that I think are relatively unusual in sort of electronic and computer music. One is that there's a clear harmonic progression. It just goes, you know... And you just sort of go back and forth between these straight-ahead harmonies. And the other thing is that uh, it sort of sounds like speech, and you get the impression that it's uh, people talking, but you can't understand what they're saying. And so part of the, the, the fun that I had with these pieces was that nobody could, everyone tried to understand what was being said, but nobody could understand what was being said. And that was part of the, the, the attraction of the pieces, I think, for a lot of people. They really sort of listened carefully, and they leaned forward to try to figure out what was going on. And then I figured that was it, you know, I, I, I'd had it <laughs> with this, this thread. And um, about 10 years after that, in the late 90s, um, I had gotten a lot better at doing certain electronic things, and I had sort of learned how to do new things. And I decided to write yet another version in the series, uh, and the point of this, there were several points in this. One point was that I wanted to try a different approach to the, the sort of basic idea. The earlier pieces use a technique called linear predictive coding, which is uh, a sort of a, a way in which you can alter the rhythm and the pitch of voices without altering the timbre. So you can make somebody talk low, you make somebody talk high. And this is actually uh, the technique that's now used in cell phones. So I didn't invent it. It was invented at Bell Labs in, in the 50s and 60s. And uh, I just used, you know, the, the, the technology. But I didn't like certain things about it. I didn't like the kind of buzzy quality it had. I didn't like the, uh, the uh, other kinds of things that it did to, to the voice. It made, made it sound unnatural. So um, I, when I wrote Idle Chatter Jr., I decided I wasn't going to do that. But, and in fact, what I was going to do was just to use normal pitch shifting, no, normal shifting on the voice. But if you take the voice and you only, and you move, you, you, you know, you slow it down or speed it up by even a small amount, it sounds really strange. So in Idle Chatter Jr., uh, as you notice in Idle, in not just more Idle Chatter, you hear some very low voices and you hear some very high voices. But in the new piece, um, I was only able to shift voices up or down by maybe a major second. So I had, as a result, the whole piece was going to be sort of be clustered around the timbre of the voice. This is my wife's voice, by the way. So uh, that was a problem. And uh, then the other thing that I wanted to work on in Idle Chatter Jr. was uh, I, I really liked the sort of harmonic progression that I used in Idle Chatter. This sort of... Um, This is a straight-ahead chord progression, so Paul Lansky wanted to try something a little more complicated. One is to um, 
do something so that the voice that's stranded right in the middle register doesn't sound terrible. And the other is to try to get a, you know, a harmonic progression, which I like. Uh, and I think it's, it's sort of paradoxical in a way that, you know, I'm doing electronic music, which is sort of classically known as uh, being more concerned with timbre, and what I'm really concerned about is, uh, is harmony. Um, so let me play the opening of Idle Chatter Jr., Oops, let me just rewind. And I'll show, I'll zoom in so that you can get a better better view. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's several things about that that I, I want to mention. The first is that um, you can hear that there are other instruments playing, with basically a you know, percussion orchestra that's playing along with it, and a piano. Um, the second thing is that you notice that the voice is really restricted to sort of this middle register. Uh, it's just doing this, and the other parts are sort of adding notes around the extremes. I came up with a, a sort of chord progression which will sound routine to a jazz player, but, you know, to a sort of classical musician like me is sort of unusual. Lansky denotes his chord progression. It was it was kind of you know it's not a it's not a fancy progression it's uh, but it's got it's got the the interesting thing about it to me is that um, in this electronic context it sort of sounds a bit wacky uh, and if you just listen to the opening of the piece again you can hear that chord progression. <laughs> So that was sort of one thing that I was interested in. And um, this comes back in different ways over the course of the piece that I think are sort of cute. Um, it, let me just play a few uh, segments, let's see. You can hear that going up a semitone. About time six in the piece, the chord progression comes back and it's slightly altered uh, and it switches to, to minor to start with. Uh, C sharp minor, I think, is that right? Time six. Transposes. 
not literally the same chord progression, but it's close enough. Are the voices clearly defining the chord progression? So what's going on um, that uh, I noticed as I was doing the piece is that I'm using that it's very hard to make out the sense of the chord progression just from the voices by themselves. If uh, in the opening of the piece, for example, if I didn't have some sort of accompaniment, it would be kind of difficult to tell. You can hear in the background, very gently, there are chords. And as the piece goes on, the, uh, the sort of background instruments uh, fleshed out. And what I was doing is, for each little segment of speech, this is taken from somebody, an actual person talking, and for each little segment of speech, I would chop off enough so that the voice was relatively flat, as if somebody was saying, in, in hello, I just take the O part, I would so that, it, and then I'd analyze what pitch it was at, and I'd transpose it so that it was close to the to a note in the chord that I wanted to prolong for that moment. Um, and this allowed me to let the voices approximately do the uh, the chords, but the voices really need help in order to to do the chords. When I was using in the older pieces using linear predictive coding. Uh, what I was able to do was to actually really flatten the voices out with that technique. So I didn't want to flatten them too much because they'd sound like robots. But uh, if I flattened them out just enough, they would sound, uh, you know, they would, you would be able to easily tell what the pitches are. And in that segment that I played from not just more idle chatter, you can tell what the chords are right away. But here the harmony sort of needs help from the other things. And then the thing that one of the things that I'm that I'm interested in uh, in this piece is that eventually, with this sort of slightly unusual tonal chord progression, at the very end of the piece, when uh, I have the instruments drop out entirely, and I just have the voices by themselves, and I think you're able to hear the chord progression finally uh, in doing this. Here's time nine in the piece. And you'll hear there's a pause, and after the pause, it starts up, and it's just the voices. Now here. So that's the way the piece ends, and uh, the, the, I'm I'm sort of pleased with, you know, the fact that I can make this chord progression, which has kind of been coming and going throughout the whole piece, sort of 
permeate the, um, the, the timbre and the texture at that last moment. And um, yeah, that works quite well. In this piece, uh, in order to flesh out the spectrum, as you notice in the very last section, the, all the all the speech was con was uh, confined to just the register between here and here, roughly. Uh, that at a lot of places in the piece, I, I sort of have these slow, sort of sustain pads, and I also have um, sort of percussion instruments, and I have a piano, and there are a couple of parts that I was really proud of. Um, that uh, I got where I got the percussion instruments going, and I sort of like to sort of zero in on a few of those. Everything stops. Nice. Bongos, and, uh, the drums. Now a low piano comes in. Yeah, another another section that uh, I think works well is about time seven. <laughs> I bring out the bass a little more here. Now the background chorus sort of comes in a little more. What is the source of the other elements? Oh, well, the other elements are all um, actual samples of instruments. There's a piano, and there are a whole bunch of percussion samples. And these are all basically taken from, you know, sample CDs. I think I synthesized a few of them here or there. It, when I started doing this in the 70s, um, they were just, we were just using mainframe computers. We didn't have, you know, little laptops like this to do this sort of thing. And uh, we had to write our own programs. So I learned programming. I learned Fortran and C and C++ and Objective-C and, and uh, these sorts of things. These days it's quite different. And I don't, I don't quite know. If somebody wanted to do a piece sort of like this, um, I'm not sure what I'd recommend. Um, there are a lot of very powerful software programs that are available for free and for money that one could use, but um, it's not, you know, it's not terribly difficult. In Idle Chatter Jr., Lansky is employing random methods. I didn't actually program each of those words by themselves. They're part of a, what's called an algorithmic process. I would sort of throw them all into a big hat and pull out one at a time randomly and then when I had pulled them all out, I'd put them all back into the hat and pull them out. I'm speaking metaphorically now, you know, this was all done on the computer. And that sort of guaranteed a kind of random distribution um, in order, uh, you know, I couldn't actually compose some of these very complicated patterns by myself. If I did, 
they would sort of probably sound predictable, and I wanted them to sound unpredictable. That's one of the attractions of the chatter pieces in general, and a lot of the computer music that I've done is that there are a lot of patterns and processes which I like to think of um, as instead of being controlled with a very n narrow paintbrush, you know, I use a big paintbrush and I sort of splatter things on the canvas. So um, I, that's one of the things the computer is very useful for is being able to, um, you know, be your be a tool that allows you to use broad brush brush strokes instead of just narrow brush strokes. People sometimes think that one of the one of the things you have to do with electronic music is control each element by itself in great detail when in fact what what's interesting to do is to uh, sometimes use the machine in order to give you you know like Jackson Pollock effect or something like that and that's what I'm doing a lot in, in these pieces electronic music is not created for the concert hall the pieces live on recording and uh, I think that's basically what, the, what I think of as the distribution method. <clears throat> They're not designed for concerts uh, as much as they are for people's home stereo systems. There are many dance companies that perform to Paul Lansky's work. Idle Chatter was done by dance companies almost as soon as it, as it was written. And uh, sometimes they do a good job and sometimes they don't. Um, if they sort of try to mimic the uh, the uh, sort of rhythm, it tends to be a little distracting. And I think it's a real problem um, with these pieces because they've got so much internal imagery that imposing yet another image on top of the uh, the sound sometimes makes the sound less interesting. And uh, what I what I worked very hard on these pieces is to make them self-contained. Idle Chatter Jr. was done by the Elliott Feld Ballet in 2004, and uh, then uh, it was done by the New York City Ballet with the same choreography uh, two years later, uh, 2006. And they did a wonderful job with it. They uh, had three... The, the, uh, the scenario was to have three men climbing a wall and they jump down from the wall to start with and they're all in sort of uh, multicolored spandex wall climbing, you know, mountain climbing outfits and they would hang from the wall as the piece went on and they'd spin their legs and uh, it was really brilliant. I thought it was, I thought it was sensational. In what direction will electronic music go? Um, where, well, let me tell you where I want it to go. I want it to disappear. Um, I, I think electronic music um, suffers by being in its own ghetto. I think computer, uh, electronic music and computer music in general suffers from being looked on as a genre. I think if it doesn't survive as music, then it doesn't really, uh, doesn't really count for anything. Music can't survive just on the basis of its own technology. In the early days, a lot of the attraction of computer music in general was not the music, but the fact that it was made on a computer. And, you know, I think that's death. That's not really, uh, it's not really what it's all about. High school students are familiar with Maestro Lansky's music. The audience for these particular pieces is not the sort of standard new music audience. The Not Just More Idle Chatter is included in a well-known music appreciation textbook. And I get email from high school students all over the country who are listening to it. Um, I had a group of uh, inner city kids from Manhattan come down to do a film interview with me for as a special project in their class after they heard not just more idle chatter on in their music appreciation course, and I was thrilled at that. Mm -hmm.